Elden Ring is from Software's largest and most anticipated title to date, a game so massive in scope and scale that it promises some players hundreds of hours of replayability and adventure. But where do you start? Well, we've compiled dozens of articles, interviews, and videos, as well as our own personal experience playing Elden Ring, with literally everything you need to know before you jump into the lands between. This is 101 things you need to know before playing Elden Ring. First, we'll be diving into the start of Elden Ring, including classes, stats, and the starting tutorial. But just a quick note that each of the sections in this video will be timestamped, so feel free to jump to the section that interests you the most. Also, if you want to see more Elden Ring guides and builds, make sure to hit that subscribe button because we'll have much more Elden Ring content coming soon. Elden Ring has 10 starting classes to choose from, which includes your starting loadout of basic gear, stat allocations, and abilities. Keep in mind that this is just a baseline for your character though, and it won't necessarily lock them into one path. Starting classes in Elden Ring cover a wide range, including the warrior, a nomad who fights wielding two blades at once, the prisoner who specializes in glintstone sorcery, the vagabond, an exiled knight in full plate armor, the hero, a battleaxe welding descendant from the Badlands, and many, many more. There'll also be a deprived class in Elden Ring called the Wretch, which has limited stats and gear at the start, to make for a truly challenging playthrough. There are eight main attributes in Elden Ring. These include vigor, mind, endurance, strength, dexterity, intelligence, faith, and arcane. Increasing many of these attributes will also increase your character's base stats. For example, more vigor equals more HP, more mind results in more FP, endurance gives you more stamina, and so on. Players will also be able to choose a starting gift, including a talisman that increases your stats, useful consumables, or a key that can help you get into special areas. And of course, Elden Ring does have a familiar badass boss right at the start that will likely kill every player, but can be returned to later for some possible nice rewards. A tutorial cave also exists right at the start. This can help you learn basic functions in Elden Ring like heavy attacks, rolling, jumping, stealthing, and much more. The world of Elden Ring is quite massive, the biggest of any Soulsborne title to date, and includes six distinct regions or biomes, including windswept fields, mountainous crags, and yes, poisonous swamps. Each region itself is incredibly large and diverse, potentially being divided into further sub-regions. For example, the first region of Limgrave has its own further definitions, which shape the landscape, including the sweeping plains of both western and eastern Limgrave, the coastal area of the Weeping Peninsula, and Stormvale Castle. Each region also contains a legacy dungeon, a sprawling and deep dungeon encounter that will remind players greatly of the Dark Souls franchise. These dungeons typically include challenging packs of enemies, mini-bosses, and an epic final boss encounter against one of the game's demigods. Each zone also includes many smaller caves, delves, mines, and other subterranean encounters, expanding the overall content of the region substantially. Roaming field bosses in each region will also present players with a significant challenge, as these often have massive AoE attacks and a large health bar. Many NPCs will appear in each region, giving you a bit of backstory or pointing you towards interesting locations that often contain new loot or side quests. Most NPCs are not marked on the map, so make sure to search far and wide. Speaking of this, Elden Ring has tons of NPCs and dialogue, possibly more than all of the Soulsborne games combined. So the storytelling and the world building in Elden Ring is going to be a lot better and I think more prevalent than most players expected. There is also a day and night cycle present in Elden Ring and more challenging enemies are known to appear at night. For example, at the bridge in Limgrave, a single black rider appeared during the network test to replace the usual mounted enemies in the area and was considerably more challenging. Regions in Elden Ring don't need to be cleared in any specific order, and legacy dungeons and the main bosses within them don't necessarily need to be defeated either. Often players will just be able to move on to the next region if they want to. Elden Ring is a true open world experience with fewer limitations on the player. Speaking of this, multiple routes to your objectives can exist, such as breaching the castle gate or going through a lesser known side entrance. We know this is an option for the first legacy dungeon, Stormvale Castle. So looking for alternate routes, especially if you'd rather avoid combat or employ stealth, will be important. Destructible environments are also fairly common in some areas, especially against bosses, so don't depend on hiding behind pillars or rocks or anything of that nature because a boss is just as likely to destroy it before destroying you. 
Recently, we found out that teleports also exist in Elden Ring. These seem to be a quick jump between two specific areas or regions, different from the bonfire like Sites of Grace that we'll talk about in just a minute. A massive underground area also exists in Elden Ring. And no, this is not just one cave or cavern. This is a huge playable area that will greatly increase the total size of the Elden Ring map. So as big as the above ground world appears to be, the underground zone will add a ton of playable land to that as well. Speaking of caves, having a torch will be essential in Elden Ring because while some caverns do have ambient light, others are completely dark. And torches can also damage enemies, catch them on fire, and reportedly there's also unique weapon arts for torch-based combat, so you'll want to pick these up as soon as possible. Let's talk about the world map next for Elden Ring, which I love. It has a beautiful hand-drawn style, which also includes a basic fog of war type of mechanic, which limits your view of regions you have yet to visit. Several different types of icons can actually be placed on the map by players, allowing you to designate points of interest to return to at a later time. The icon that you choose is up to you, but there's plenty of options for notating challenging bosses, consumables for crafting, quest NBCs, and more. Some specific locations will have their own custom icon revealed on the map once they are discovered by the player. And beacons can be placed anywhere on the map. Those beacons will then appear in the game world as tall pillars of light, helping you more easily track down your desired objectives. On the map, you'll also notice a prominent sundial that tells the time of day or night. And a very important item to look out for is going to be map fragments. Each map fragment you obtain will reveal a section of that area's map revealing locations you might have missed otherwise. The gameplay loops in Elden Ring should be quite familiar to players that have played games like Dark Souls, but Elden Ring is much more than simply Dark Souls 4. Some of the best gameplay systems of the Soulsborne franchise have returned here, and some new systems have been introduced as well. For example, souls are now called runes, just like other Souls games, you can use these to level up your character or purchase items from NPCs. Bonfires are now Sites of Lost Grace. These are spread out all over the open world and allow for similar tasks to bonfires like leveling up and placing attribute points. Dying in Elden Ring will send you back to the nearest Site of Lost Grace or if one is nearby, a Stake of Marika. Stakes of Marika are another new type of death mechanic that allows you to respawn even closer to difficult enemies without having to complete lengthy boss runs. So if you notice one of these in your travels, get ready because something dangerous is probably nearby. Now on death, as you might assume, you do drop all of your currently held runes on the ground. Uh, you do have a chance during your next life to go back and retrieve those. And speaking of death, fall damage has been significantly reduced in Elden Ring to help you better navigate the massive open world. And you probably already know this by now, but jumping is now a critical element of Elden Ring. It's going to add even more mobility and exploration options into the core gameplay. Now, in terms of game modes, there is a new Game Plus feature in Elden Ring. There are also multiple endings. And I thought this was interesting. A recent interview with one of the game's developers noted that it will be impossible to 100% Elden Ring in your first playthrough due to the multiple branching pathways of the game, especially towards later stages of the game. There is no difficulty slider or easy mode available in Elden Ring. Instead, players that are struggling are encouraged to continue exploring for better weapons, armor, and abilities, level up their character further, or seek help of other players via online co-op. Also, just like Dark Souls, standard health and FP flasks are going to be there for players, as well as many, many other consumable items. And actually defeating groups of enemies will often refill all of your flasks, helping you to keep moving forward in the midst of intense combat. In Elden Ring, players will even have the ability to mix their own customized flasks, mixing in additional effects like restored stamina and even explosive AoE damage. This comes from an item called the Flask of Wondrous Physic, which is obtained later on in the game. And finally, yes, phantoms, bloodstains, player messages all return to Elden Ring, allowing you to see traces of other players and their most recent actions in the game. So, Sites of Lost Grace, this is something that we mentioned earlier. It's a big component of the game, so I wanted to break this down for you a little bit more. 
Now, through your map, you can instantly fast travel to any site of Lost Grace that you've previously discovered, though there are some dungeons and other areas where this type of travel is disabled. Sites of Lost Grace allow you to allocate your flasks between health and FP for whatever suits your build best. Resting at the site of Lost Grace will also restore all of your HP, FP, and heal any status effects. It also refills all of your flasks. Most enemies you've defeated will be revived when you rest at a site of Lost Grace. And most of the crafting resources that you find out in the world will also be replaced at their spawn points when resting here as well. Sites of Lost Grace are small and they're relatively easy to miss out in the open world. So to help with this, these sites shoot a faint stream of light into the air so they're easier to spot behind brush or rocks and other debris. Once discovered, sometimes these rays of glowing light will then shift in another direction, pointing you towards your next objective or another site of Lost Grace. Also keep in mind that these sites often serve as the location for cutscenes and important story events in Elden Ring. So you're going to want to make sure you unlock as many of these as possible to progress the game's story. Let's transition now into combat, which honestly could be an entire video in itself. FromSoft has given us so many combat options in Elden Ring that the amount of expression you can have with a build is nearly endless. As you might expect, in a Souls-style game, weapons can be either one-handed or two-handed in many cases. Two-handing weapons will give you access to unique weapon art type attacks. These are called Ashes of War. We'll talk more about this later. Charged attacks are also possible in Elden Ring resulting in even more damage as well as posture damage. Posture damage on enemies is going to be a huge part of combat in Elden Ring, though there is no visible meter on enemies that shows you how much posture damage they've taken. Once you do break their posture, it'll be easier for you to land some massive critical hits. Spells are going to be a massive part of Elden Ring as well. These generally come in the form of sorceries or incantations. Sorceries usually require a specific amount of intelligence stat in order to use while incantations will require faith, and both types of magic are going to use FP to cast. Also, spells in Elden Ring can be charged just like weapons can, often uh, giving them entirely new effects. For example, some charge spells might also knock down mounted enemies or place longer lasting effects in the world. And this is for basically the same amount of FP as the regular version of casting the spell. So anytime you can get that extra charge in is definitely worth it. This brings us to another unique aspect of combat in Elden Ring, Ashes of War. These are basically combat arts that can be acquired. Ashes can be applied to most weapons and are interchangeable. Like I said, basically think of these as weapon arts or combat styles. Ashes of War in Elden Ring are extremely powerful. They also cost FP to cast. They can be purchased, found in the world, or looted from slain enemies. Keep in mind that some unique weapons have an Ash of War that cannot be changed out and only works with that specific weapon. Power Stancing makes a return to Elden Ring, allowing players to unlock new and powerful movesets while using two weapons at the same time. The main restriction here is that both weapons need to be of the same type. And we touched on jumping earlier in Elden Ring as a new means for movement and exploration, but jumping also serves a major purpose in combat as well. For example, jumping attacks seem to have iframes to help you avoid damage within a relatively short window, and jumping attacks also do significantly more health and posture damage to enemies. These are also great for doing additional damage to mounted enemies and knocking them down. Now, there are several guard mechanics in Elden Ring as well, and guarding is obviously most effective if you have a shield equipped. When timed correctly with your own attack, guarding can actually result in a guard counter. Uh, you'll get a unique visual and sound effect played when you do a successful guard counter, and this can also open up enemies to critical damage and break their stance as well. As you might expect in Elden Ring, guarding does consume stamina, and if you run out of stamina, your own stance will be broken. Moving with the crouch button, aka stealth in Elden Ring, can also have a big impact on combat. If you want it to, enemies will be less likely to notice you in that crouched state, and this is amplified even further during nighttime. Attacking enemies while crouched can also result in big crit damage. Different enemies will require different strategies. This is especially true with larger packs of enemies that can include fast mounted units, foot soldiers, ranged mages and archers, and enemies welding horns or trumpets. 
which by the way, if these guys notice you, they will alert the entire army of enemies to your presence. So be sure to take these out first and stealthily if you can. Moving on, we definitely need to talk about your horse and Elden Ring, which is going to add a whole new layer of depth and complexity to the game, both in terms of exploration and combat. Torrent is your trustworthy and magical steed for your journey in Elden Ring. He's first obtained by speaking to Melina at a site of Lost Grace. While riding Torrent, you can double jump by pressing the jump button in quick succession. Another great feature. And bursts of quick speed are possible on Torrent as well, helping you clear a wider distance between you and your enemies, though this does cost stamina. Now you can use most basic attacks, weapon arts, and even cast spells while mounted, though these often have different animations and even different cast times when compared to using them on the ground. So make sure to take the time to practice on weaker enemies to get your timing right before you fight anything stronger, like a field boss while on horseback. While mounted, R1 and R2 are going to give you light and heavy attacks with your equipped weapon for the right side, and the same thing is true L1 and L2 for your attacks on the left side. And charged heavy attacks while mounted are possible as well. That does include charged spells also, like we mentioned earlier, you're just gonna hold down the heavy attack button. Though these do have greatly extended cast times, leaving you vulnerable to attacks. Still, these seem like an extremely powerful way to defeat enemies in the open field if you can time them correctly. Now, if you take too much damage while on horseback, you will fall off, landing flat on your back, leaving you vulnerable for several seconds, most likely getting you killed in the process. It's much better instead to dismount or jump from your horse before this happens. Now, one of the coolest things you can also do while mounted are using these jump pads located throughout the world known as Spirit Springs. Jumping on the Spirit Spring while mounted on Torrent will give you an extra powerful boosted jump, pushing you extremely high in the air. Riding that current of air from the Spirit Spring can help you reach new and difficult to access areas. Also note that you won't take fall damage on Torrent if you land or you fall into one of those spirit springs while mounted as well, even if you're falling from a very high up location. So this is yet another great traversal method. There are some limitations to using Torrent, though not many. You won't be able to use them in many of the walled off areas of the game, including forts, castles, underground sections, and of course, legacy dungeons. You also can't ride your horse in co-op or PVP encounters. And in fact, if you get invaded while mounted on Torrent, you'll be forced off until the encounter is complete. Another type of spirit in Elden Ring are your spirit summons. These actually function as items and summon powerful creatures or even packs of spirits to aid you in combat. First, you must obtain the spirit either through defeating enemies, purchasing from a vendor, or finding one out in the world, and then slot that into your inventory. Spirits can only be summoned in difficult areas though, usually a boss fight or when fighting a large pack of static enemies. You'll know that summoning a spirit in the area is possible if you see a stone obelisk nearby or this symbol on the left side of the screen. Spirit summons do use your FP to cast and you can only have one spirit equipped at a time, so be selective here. The power level of your spirits seems to be related to their cost in FP as well, so especially early on, you might not have enough FP to cast a summon requiring you to upgrade your mind stat before you can actually use it. Spirit summons, though, often draw the attention of multiple enemies at once, serving as a great distraction, but they can easily die just as quickly. Spirits can be healed if you have your own healing spells, and if your spirit dies, you'll need to wait until the fight is over, or you yourself die to cast it again. Spirits can be improved or enhanced at the game's main hub area. More on this later. Equipment, crafting, and upgrades are going to be another major component of your playtime in Elden Ring. Managing your equip weight is going to be important, for example. An equip load system is present in Elden Ring, and with this system, when you carry more than 70% of your maximum equipment load, your dodge rolling becomes slower and more clumsy, leading to the classic fat roll. If you exceed the max equip load, you will then lose your dodge rolling completely. Heavy armor in the game does provide higher poise for your build, making you less likely to stagger from enemy attacks. Wielding a heavy weapon with two hands also provides a similar effect. Rings in the game have been altered to be more like consumable items. You'll see this, for example, in the ring item that summons Torrent. 
Instead of equipping rings in Elden Ring, you will instead unlock slots for talismans. Some talismans give you powerful bonuses to specific weapons like increased damage on the final strike using a twin blade, while other talismans just give you basic bonuses to things like health, stamina, and your FP pool. Mything tables can be found in Elden Ring to complete some minor upgrades to weapons. This costs an increasing amount of both runes and smithing stones with each upgrade. In the network test, for example, the maximum upgrade was plus three. This is still true, but it is possible to further upgrade weapons at a blacksmith, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Armor and Elden Ring can be changed in appearance using tailoring tools, which will give you more fashion souls options, including adding or removing cloaks from your armor. Players will be able to get a crafting kit fairly early on in the game. In the network test, this was purchased from the first merchant. And basic crafted items in the game include things such as ranged options like arrows, throwing knives, and bombs, consumable buffs, or weapon coatings that can increase the damage of your equipped weapons by adding special effects. More advanced recipe books can be found out in the world or purchased from NPC merchants. And crafting ingredients can be found literally anywhere in the game, dependent on that region's biome, like butterflies or fruits in the fields of Limgrave, or mushrooms and roots in the caverns below. Finally, I wanted to mention the hub world of Elden Ring, which you'll be spending quite a bit of time in as well. This is called Roundtable Hold, and it is Elden Ring's hub area where you can meet even more NPCs, work on upgrading your gear and abilities, and receive important quests and backstory information. Now, you can't actually travel uh, by foot to Roundtable Hold. You'll need to access this through fast travel. In Roundtable Hold, you'll have access to several trainers to increase your skills. Apparently, there is one here to increase the potency of your spirit summons as well. You'll also have access to the blacksmith in this hub area, allowing you to upgrade your weapons to the best stats possible. Different reports on this so far. I've heard plus 12 might be the max. Maybe slightly more than that. We'll have to see. Finally, I did want to mention that apparently there is a special mirror located within Roundtable Hold. This will allow you to change your character's appearance from how you designed your character initially during character creation. But with that said, ladies and gentlemen, that is 101 things you need to know before playing Elden Ring. Hope you enjoy your time in the lands between and that this video has given you some good ideas on where to start. And I did want to mention there are several more tips and tricks that I couldn't actually fit into this video guide. And if you want to see those as well, those are over at our website RPGDojo.com where you can see everything in this guide and more in written form as part of our Elden Ring wiki. Uh, of course, if you enjoyed this video and you found it informative, please do us a favor and crush that like button. Let us know what you're most looking forward to about Elden Ring in the comments section below. And as always, thank you all so much for watching, and we will see you in the next video.